Good morning, Revolution, and welcome to our show this morning on this good day of February the 4th, uh, 2022. I got the year right this time <laughs> anyway. Rosanna, Michael, good morning. Scott, what's up with you? Good morning, good morning, Revolution. Good morning, Scott, Revolution. You, going, you got that note in here. <laughs> you're going gray. You're going gray. Um, is that a sign of uh, maturity or worry? Or maybe a little <laughs> bit of both? <bold. laughs> well, we got a lot to talk about this morning. I see that uh, Scott's homeboy, Mr. Biden, came to New York City and met with uh, the uh, new mayor. And they have unveiled a anti-crime, uh, anti-gun violence uh, program, and they say that they're bosom buddies. Did you take a look at that, Scott? I I did I did not. You know, being right. from upstate New York, it's a uh, we're not allowed to even notice what goes on in New York City. Uh, well, I mean, being from upstate, you should recognize some of the issues. Uh, for sure, there's a big concern about the rise of violence and and uh, murder. A number of police have been. I think two or three have been shot, uh, children being shot in the streets in New York. Uh, well, I mean, when, you, when, when you talk about gun violence, and I, this is something I'm, I'm familiar with, you know, the same debate and the same problem uh, was happening in Chicago uh, when I lived there. Um, the solution to gun violence is not to put more and more heavily armed police on the street. Um, it, it hasn't worked so far. It's been tried over and over again. Uh, and, you know, we, we don't, we, we're not going to make things safer by, by policing things uh, harder. Uh, okay, well, how do you make it safer? Well, you need massive investment in communities that have been marginalized and, and underserved. You need um, jobs and education and, um, you know, mental health facilities, and you need to work on building communities and cities and a society that um, gives people a, a path forward and, and a way to be a part of it. You can't just, you know, keep shutting down uh, public libraries, shutting down mental health clinics, cutting public services, and then, you know, dealing with the inevitable problems that result by pointing a gun at them. That's not, that's ridiculous. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, uh, Rosanna, is that the solution? More <laughs> mental health facilities, more investment, more, 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 more. Isn't that just tax and spend, Democratic Party, <laughs> big liberal policies that are uh, pandering to uh, whoever? You know, the taxes are people's money. And so it should be spent on the people. We put in those taxes. We pay for those politicians' salaries. We pay for those programs. Nobody's handing us anything. So definitely it should be. One of my things is that there's not enough programs for young people for that adolescent stage of, of youth that, that, you know, they don't, they don't fall anymore into, you know, the small soccer leagues or anything like that. And they're just not quite adults. And so it's like everybody, everything drops off for them. And so we don't provide any kinds of services or extracurricular activities, uh, all of these kinds of things for them. And so that's also part of the problem. But I think it's more important is to, to remember that these are our tax dollars. We're not hand, nobody's handing us anything. And, and we should be the ones to determine how to spend that money. Okay, well, that's a good point. We should determine how this money is spent. Uh, but Michael, in your opinion, you're a, native, you're a New Yorker, you're not a native New Yorker, but you're, what did you, did, did, what did you think about the Adams-Biden uh, summit yesterday? Well, you know, it was, I was thinking more upon, uh, along the lines of the big, it was a military parade of police officers that Eric Adams had, you know, last week or so. And I thought, God, that's just represents how militarized this institution has become, you know, the NYPD. 
And I'm proud to say that we had some comrades out there yesterday um, uh, on a few issues, you know, trying to flag down Biden and let him know about the war in Russia and defunding the police and so forth. Um, and so that was, you know, I, I'm glad that we're out there to kind of talk about the issues. Um, I'm glad that I forget the guy that was running against Eric Adams, Sliwa, that kind of fascist guy that was in the Guardian Angels, you know, with the red hat. I'm glad he certainly didn't win, but I don't think there's going to be a whole lot of progress um, under Adams either. You know, we are that big fight that we uh, played a big role in, yeah, now two summers ago to defund the police in the, in the aftermath of the killing of George Floyd, you know, when we were camped out outside of City Hall so that they could defund the police by a billion dollars, you know, that's still fresh in a lot of young people's minds, you know, and so um, it's going to be that struggle taking place uh, uh, moving forward. I believe that the police budget should be cut, like the military budget should be cut. And I believe that that money should be directed at social programs. But, you know, in my opinion, that's not going to be enough. I think that, and I, I believe in job creation, but in my opinion, that's not going to be enough either. You know what the solution to pro part of this big problem with, with uh, the killings and murders on the streets, the shootings? Drugs, drugs, gang wars. And unless you deal with that, you're not going to be able to successfully uh, deal with this problem. Am I right or wrong? You're right. right. And I, I think it affects, the, it affects that group. What you, what you mean by dealing with the, like... Legalize it. Gang problem. How do you... Legalize uh, it. You got to legalize drugs. You got to take it out of the hands of the gangsters the uh, and the cartels and the big banks. Well, I guess it will still be in the hands of the big banks. It's hard to... Big pharma. It's hard to... It's hard to get around that under capitalism, but you know it's it's a lot of this is due to gang wars, um, and and now jobs is going to help if you give the young people good paying, decent jobs, and and that that kind of thing. They won't have to get out there and hustle on on the uh, street. But to me, Scott, a lot of this is due to gang wars. Well, I um. I was afraid. I, I I was a little worried there for a second. It sounded like you were you were going in a, a very like a, you know pro pro police pro like crackdown direction because um, that that's what when um, when I hear people talk about you know we need to address the gang problem it's usually a prelude to you know we need more cops and we need harsher enforcement but I agree with you one hundred percent we need to um, substance abuse and addiction is a medical problem not a not a criminal uh, matter, um, and it needs to be drugs need to be either um, at least decriminalized and and you know legalized where where appropriate. But also, again, with the social programs, we need to give people, uh, young people in particular, as Rosanna said, something to to fight for. You know, we need to give them, help them build communities that they're invested in and that they're willing to, um, you know to protect and, and, and keep building. Um, so the two go together, I think. Another issue is community control of the police. Uh, you know, because our communities feel like occupied territories. In fact, they are occupied territories. And, and there's a great deal of fear and resentment uh, uh, to the cops because they act like occupying forces, uh, Rosanna. And so un until the people have control of, over who's hired and who's fired and how they're trained and how they're disciplined and all of that, that's going to continue, it seems to me, you know. Yeah, the people don't have any trust in the police that, that the police no. have their best interests, not at all. It's more about, you know, even if you're not doing anything wrong, you're made to feel like you're doing something wrong just by the way they look at you or the way they question you. And it just, it doesn't create any kind of sense of being protected in any way. It's more of, you fear the police more than you would fear, you know, a gang member. 10 <laughs> years ago. Member have a sense of, they have a sense of respect. Cops don't respect you in any way, shape or form. You're always under suspicion. 10 years ago, I'm riding down the street on my scooter, right? 
I had, I, I'm on my scooter. I just come from riding my bar, bike um, up at the West Side Highway, went to Central Park, came back down. I'm coming down 23rd Street with my scooter and bike in one hand, and I get pulled over by the police. And they said, oh, you, whose bicycle is that? I said, what do you mean, who's, it's my bike. And, and, and they, 15 minutes searches and calling it in and <laughs> what do I look like? Disabled guy <laughs> with a, Stealing somebody's bike, Michael. I mean, come on. Oh, I know. Well, and I think Rosanna, back to her point of like um, the age group that's affected by this 15, 16 years old, you know, that not that quite like adulthood, but also not like you have to be babysat at home. I think that's the group that's at risk, not only for gang violence and uh, police violence. You know, Tamir Rice was shot, I believe, when he was 13 or 12, 13. But I'm thinking back to when I first got my license in Ohio, I was 15, 16. And, you know, I pick up my friend, Armand, African-American, dark skin, right? And uh, we get pulled over because our headlights aren't on. It was daytime. And uh, I'm the one driving and they asked to see his license. But I'm the one driving, right? That's the world that young people were growing up in. Uh, and, you know, that was however many years ago. That was 12, 13 years ago, you know. And so I think that something has to be done. And I agree that after school programs, social programs, um, jobs, I don't think that's going to be enough. I think we really have to keep our eye on the prize and it's workers taking political power. I know they'll get the job done because that workers have our best interests at heart, our fellow workers. Speaking of, 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 I told them, why are you bothering me? Why don't you go down to Wall Street and investigate those thieves who are stealing fortune from the people? You're messing around with me. Speaking of doing investigations, how about the attacks of the bomb threats against the black colleges yesterday? 14 schools had bomb threats right at the beginning of Black History Month. Are they trying to scare this country into a civil war? I bet you it's the same groups, or at least some of the same groups that had something to do with January 6th. It's your Proud Boys, your QAnon, your Ku Klux Klan, your neo-Nazis, all of these groups that were growing during the Trump era. And they, you know, kind of faced a setback after January 6th, the coup didn't succeed, uh, succeed. And so I guarantee you once the FBI looks into it, if they do look into it, because they still don't know who's behind it, I bet you we're going to find some signs of some of these, you know, extreme right groups. I wouldn't be surprised if it came from the National Committee of the Republican Party, Scott. I mean, yeah, I mean, one way or another, it does, uh, because um, or behind the people who are the backers of the of the Republican Party, the you know, the billionaires and the, the people funding stuff like the, the Heritage Foundation and all of that, who, you know, been funneling money to um, covert and overt white supremacist groups for decades and decades now. Um, uh, yeah, of course, they're, of course, they're behind it. Um, but well, and, I thought and this I question heard... of civil war is an interesting one. I think what's, you know, there, there's one side of this fight the side that lost the first civil war that wants to give it another try. And then those of us on the other side, I don't want a civil war, um, but I would like to finish reconstruction. You know, I think that's something that, that I, I think that maybe that's, that's really what the other side is fighting for. Our, our side is fighting for is to, to finish that democratic revolution that, that was, that took such a huge step forward after the, the civil war in the 1860s. Uh, with uh, with radical reconstruction, um, that process needs to continue, um, and we don't have time to to refight a civil war. We already we already won. We need to move forward. Rosanna, you were going to say? Yeah, I thought I heard that uh, they did already find out that there were I think about six uh, underage kids that were behind that, uh, but I'm not absolutely sure. Six tech-savvy juveniles reportedly identified as persons of interest as over a dozen IBCUs received bomb threats in two days. That's, this is from The Guardian I'm reading. So. You wonder what their upbringings are. <clears throat> you know, once you know. again, our young people are being, right, our, our young people are being steered in this way. Yeah, 
Because wasn't the young guy that shot up, I forget his name, uh, the, the, the church, the black church in um, yeah. Charleston, you know, he was, a, I think he was underage, but they yeah. looked at his social media and there's Nazi flags and yeah. AK-47s and, you know. Exactly. And, and, and social media spaces are not something that just spontaneously comes into being, though they're, they're organized and they're set up in very specific ways to privilege and to promote certain forms of speech and certain ways of engagement. Um, we have all that going on, all that going on, and they want to take out critical race theory, whatever that means, you know, teaching about racism, teaching history in schools. They want to ban books, you know, to Toni Morrison and books about the Holocaust. It's just, it's beyond me. I don't understand. But there has been an atmosphere, here's the point, that's been uh, stimulated uh, and, and, and uh, stirred uh, and pushed and exacerbated from on high by the president himself, uh, former president who at rallies and, uh, and press conferences encouraged uh, a violence. Um, and, and then you had situations where militias were occupying state capitals in Virginia and in uh, Michigan and other parts of the country. And nobody said a word. Nobody said a word, huh? We said plenty. <laughs> we said plenty, but no, <laughs> nobody was <laughs> listening to us. And 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 so um, increasingly, you read articles in the newspaper that are posing the question: uh, Are we on the verge of another civil war? Um, and 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 that's a danger. In fact, I read an article in the I don't know the Post or the New York Times or one of those USA Today uh, said that this writer believed that in fact that that was likely. Uh, it was a woman. I forget her name, and she said that well, it's not going to be kind of like the war that was fought during the Civil War, but more of a long-term kind of ace. What they call that asymmetrical. Uh, which is a fancy way of saying it, is going to be in spurts, a bomb threat here, uh, an assassination there, you know, um, that kind of, uh, of a kind of a guerrilla right-wing terroristic attacks on, uh, on uh, democracy. Well, that's, that's how it was fought in Ireland, the Troubles. It was, it was sporadic like that. It wasn't two militaries engaging each other, but it was, you know, uh, decades of that kind of uh, terrorism, you know. So what do you do about something like that? How do you address it? Well, I, jobs, I, more money for social programs. I think, you know, gun we, control. We hold fast to the, the idea that you know, the, the working class has to be the leading force in, in moving society forward. And despite, you know, how successful the extreme right and the fascist forces have been at uh, bringing a, a section of our class under their sway, um, most, the vast majority of working people, the majority of working people, let's say, um, uh, still, believe in democracy, still believe in peaceful transfer of power, still believe uh, they, they, they might be losing hope, they might be losing faith in institutions, but they want to believe in um, a particular vision of society that, that has been disseminated, which is you know, that we are a democracy and that we work things out peacefully through the political process. And, and that's something that you know, we need to help people realize that that's something that, that needs to be. It doesn't just happen. We need to struggle for that to be the reality. Um, All right. Let me, let me, Rosanna, give you a case in point. I was talking to a, a cat yesterday in, uh, in uh, Georgia, and it was a really, really encouraging conversation. He said that 90% of the of voters eligible for registration in the state of Georgia, on the red clay of Georgia, are registered, 95%. And when say Stacey Abrams and them started there, it was that there were like 1 million unregistered uh, people in the African-American community. 
and now it's 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 almost complete. And and there's a big big surge I was reading this morning of registration among Latino Asians, also young people in the state of Georgia. Um, but support for the Democratic Party in the state of Georgia has dropped by 30% just over the last, because people feel like the promises that were made haven't been delivered. Stacey Abrams is still popular. The senator from Georgia, uh, Reverend uh, Warnock. Warnock. Warnock, still popular, but support for the national dropped by 30% because, so what do we do about that? I mean, that's part of the problem, Rosanna, this crisis and, and people are just, you know, they, they, they get registered, they go out, they vote, and still nothing happens. Well, it's part of that whole, you know, the capitalist system that makes you, that gives you that whole illusion that, um, that voting doesn't matter, that you don't have any power, that uh, there's no hope, things are always gonna be the same, all of these things. And so we have to really work to dispel it. And um, sometimes, you know, through experience, through struggle is how you learn. <clears throat> I think the American people are learning more and more uh, which side they should be on and, and, uh, and be able to, to um, withstand some of these setbacks. But I think the most important thing is to point out that there is a, the light at the end of the tunnel. And we don't know how long that tunnel is, but there is a light at the end of it. And that's called socialism. And so we've got to struggle for that and move in that direction as slow as it may be. But, you know, it'll, we'll have some space where we'll be running into it, <laughs> towards it. <clears throat> and and they're all alternatives. There's alternatives. Yeah. You know, exactly. join yeah. the Communist Party. You're upset with the two corporate parties. Join us. We're pretty cool. You know, we have we don't have all the answers, but we have a great program. We're growing. We're moving forward. And this this question of the vote and whether it means something or whether it matters is that's not a question that's already decided. I feel like people approach it as um, either, you know, the vote is this powerful, amazing thing and and you know, we just need to vote and, and that'll do it. And on the other side, oh no, the vote is just an illusion. It's a, you know, it's a whatever, it's a, it's a sop that the capitalist system throws. But both of those are possible, right? Our task is to, the task of building democracy is to make our votes matter. And that's not something that's just gonna be handed to us. It's, you know, we have to be, I mean, the fight for the right to cast a ballot is is one thing, and even that's not one, but the fight for that ballot to actually be, how did Joe put it last week? The 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 fight to make representation represent is, you know, is a bigger fight, and, and we're we're in that. If our every votes state do matter, you know, our votes do matter. That's why they continually support so, try to suppress it. That's yeah, if if, if 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 voting didn't matter, they wouldn't be spending exactly. billions of dollars every year and lobbyists and all kinds of things to suppress that vote amongst Black folk, Latino, young people, and so on and uh, so forth. And if every state was uh, uh, mobilized in the way the state of Georgia is mobilized, we'd be in a different situation. And that third reconstruction that. Uh, you were talking about Scott might be uh, might be possible because you got to combine voting with street heat, with strikes, with occupations. You got to push like hell in order for real change to uh, real change to uh, uh, happen. Well, we have some questions this week from our listening audience. Um, Let's take a shot at it. Let's see. We got one question that said, um, uh, "Does the Communist Party have any plans or stances on the possibility of unifying all of the American Communist parties into one single force? Is the party in favor of a united front 
or a complete merger. Michael, <laughs> no. are you in favor of a united front of the communist parties or do you just want a merger? I'm in favor of a united front of all working class and progressive and anti-fascist organizations as, is the, as states our program, the part, Communist Party program. We're in favor of the anti-fascist people's front and eventually an anti-monopoly coalition now, I don't know what the question means by uh, uniting all communist parties. Um, they may be referencing these different Maoist or Trotskyite groups. And so to that, I say, you know, I think we work with any group that has the most immediate needs of the working people at heart, you know, but if we're out there talking about, you know, um, health care and raising the minimum wage and these immediate needs that working people are demanding, and you're out there talking about civil war now, peasant rebellion now, revolution or nothing, you know, that's not really where the workers are. So you have to meet them where they are and not where you want them to be. Um, but, you know, we're all, of course, for working with others in the struggle uh, for democracy and socialism. Yeah. Rosanna, United Front or merger? United well, Front. It's all about United Front. United Front. Scott? Um, the, the unity that we need is the unity of the working class within itself and also the unity of the working class with its allies. Those are what will get us to socialism. Um, this idea of, of left parties, communist parties, putting aside their differences and you know, uh, forming a, a merging or, or, or whatever, forming a coalition of communist parties, that's not, that's not a reality here. And even, even if it were, um, even if those differences were things that could be the strategic and tactical differences that Michael was talking about could just be set aside, it would still be a tiny, 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 tiny fraction of the forces that are needed for, for real social change. Um, so like, yeah, I agree. We, whatever we're, we're with, with anybody who's working to unite the working class and its allies in the fight for democracy. Um, and yeah, period. <laughs> And Scott has the last word. Thank you for listening. We'll see you next week. Still then, till then, I said still then. <laughs> stay strong, stay safe, stay in the fight. Have a great week, everybody. Bye. See you, comrades.